On this episode of Urban U, we continue our CUNY Street series with a look at Brooklyn. What history is there to uncover behind our BK campus addresses? We'll place a spotlight on Miss America and speak to an author who wrote about medical racism impacting births. And art, lots of it, to soothe the soul. Welcome to Urban U. The cityscape of New York is as much ingrained into the fabric of CUNY as CUNY is ingrained into the fabric of New York. After all, that's why the show's called Urban U, right? So we're digging into that relationship at its most fundamental level, continuing our series on the stories behind the streets that our colleges call home. This month, Brooklyn. Four CUNY schools call Brooklyn home. Brooklyn College, naturally, as well as Medgar Evers College, Kingsborough Community College, and the New York City College of Technology, City Tech. To start things off, a street which takes us back to the very earliest days of European settlement in New York, Bedford Avenue, where both Brooklyn College and Medgar Evers reside. Before the British took control, in the 1600s, the Dutch were the ones to settle the land, after buying it from the Canarsie Indians. Most records would indicate the avenue would ultimately get its name from a Dutch settlement there, the village of Bedford. Possibly an adaptation of the Dutch word bestivar, itself a translation of an American Indian word, meaning the place where old men meet. However, some have argued that the incoming English settlers had more a hand in the naming, instead inspired by their own Duke of Bedford, or the English County of Bedfordshire. Either way, Bedford Avenue stands now as the longest street in all of Brooklyn. Moving to the waterfront, Kingsborough Community College on Oriental Boulevard. After the Civil War, the neighborhoods east of Coney Island boomed as a hotel resort area, as an easier, but no less exclusive destination for the upper class. In its heyday, tens of thousands of visitors would pour in for nightly fireworks displays, shows, and performances by famous conductors of the day, like John Philip Sousa. The most upscale destination was the farthest away, you know, from the commoners, Manhattan Beach, the present day home of Kingsborough. And Oriental Boulevard took its name from the most prestigious of the hotels there, the Oriental Hotel. And while the hotel would be demolished in 1916 as the resort industry declined, the name would last. And finally, back west, we have City Tech on J Street. J Street was named after John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States, and a host of other titles as a founding father. He was a signatory of the Treaty of Paris, ending the Revolutionary War, de facto Secretary of State under George Washington, and the second governor of New York. And of course, CUNY's John Jay College is also named after him. And with that, we leave Brooklyn. So until the next borough we dive into, I'm Ari Goldberg for the record. I stumbled on the pageant five or six years ago on just scrolling around on television and saw the women parading around in swimsuits, couldn't believe it still existed, and had all the sort of classic feminist prejudices against pageantry that I wanted to explore why it still existed, but I was also wanting to understand who benefited from it and why they participated. I think the public thinks of Miss America as a little bit of a bobblehead and sort of pretty nice, accommodating, congenial, uh, without much substance. And one thing I discovered in researching the book was that that is not true, that many of the winners are quite substantial and have uh, achieved some very interesting things. 
Tess Meyerson is one of those fascinating Miss Americas. She's the only Jewish Miss America in history. When she won right after World War II, she discovered that the win did not pave her way to acceptance. She began touring and when she hit the South, uh, was appearing in venues that prohibited Blacks and Jews from performing or appearing and turned on her heel and went home and abandoned the mission that she had been assigned for Miss America and set out on her own to talk about Jewish pride. Yolande Bet Bees is one of everybody's favorite Miss America. She was from Alabama. She competed and won. Then the next day when she was meeting with the pageant organizers and sponsors, they said, okay, so here's what you, we have in store for you. You're going to be modeling swimsuits in department stores as one of your responsibilities. And she said, uh-uh, not doing that, and refused. She was a great example of one of the rebels and one of the people who got out of it what she wanted. The pageant has always been rife with contradictions, starting with the addition of the scholarship in the 40s. The director, Lenora Slaughter, wanted women to have more, to win more from this competition. But she also told them all along the way that their greatest achievement would be to find a husband. She also instituted rule number seven in the 1940s that said contestants must be in good health and of the white race, which was on the books into the 50s. That was obviously very problematic. The first black woman didn't compete until 1970. And then the first black winner, of course, was Miss New York, Vanessa Williams. America. 10 months into her reign, when it was revealed that she had posed naked for photos, she was forced to resign. It was a huge scandal, but she is the most popular Miss America, the most successful. She's the one Miss America whose name people today recognize. She's had a sustained career as a singer, as an actress, as Broadway performer. And she managed to do that, I would say, in spite of Miss America, not because of Miss America. The pageant has been reactive more often than reflective of American progress, but rarely in step with it. And a lot of the changes came late to the pageant. The question of whether it will last is really difficult. And I think that that is the main struggle for the competition now. We need to look at the way racism is manifest within the medical system and the medical technological complex itself to see if there are particular ways in which medical professionals are treating or not treating Black women or Black birthing people. My name is Donna Ayeen Davis. I am the director for the Center of the Study of Women and Society at the Graduate Center. And I am the author of Reproductive Injustice, Racism, Pregnancy, and Premature Birth. In this book, Davis features several Black women who discuss the racial bias they experienced at the hands of medical professionals during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. It's a timely text given how Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women, according to the Centers for Disease Control. The CDC also reports that most pregnancy-related deaths are preventable, yet the racial and ethnic disparities persist. 
some of the examples from the from the book include um, this concept of, or this idea rather, of being neglected and being um, silenced. Like LaShonda Hazard, a 27-year-old Rhode Island resident who texted her friend during her doctor's visit, saying she was in excruciating pain. They're not doing anything about it. I'm literally dying, she said in the text. She did die, and so did her unborn baby. Amber Isaac, a former resident of the Bronx, tweeted about her prenatal experience with, quote, incompetent doctors. She died right after giving birth to her son. The dismissiveness that comes with the articulation of the sense that something is happening is what many women attribute to racism, as if we don't know enough, we don't really know medicine, we don't really know our bodies. Like I know one perspective is that Black people can tolerate pain more so than... And, right. The example that I was going to give is one case with a woman named uh, Yvette who um, went into, uh, really went into early labor uh, and and checked herself into an emergency room. And rather than actually try to determine if she was in labor, they kept testing her twice for methamphetamines because the assumption was that she was in pain, but she wasn't manifesting, as she, these were her words, I wasn't manifesting enough pain or manifesting my pain in a loud voice. So they thought that she was on drugs. It's an issue that cuts across economic class among Black women, which is partly why Davis chose middle to upper class Black women as the focus for her book. Take tennis phenom Serena Williams, for example, she had to insist that her doctors give her specific medication and a scan after she was experiencing shortness of breath while recovering from the birth of her baby. Despite her history with a pulmonary embolism, she was told she was overreacting. Turns out, after giving birth, she had several blood clots in her lungs and a large hematoma in her abdomen that could have killed her. What do you feel can be done to correct this problem? I am not trying to argue that we don't need any form of medical intervention. But I do think that if people were more um, educated about birthing options, including home births, including birthing centers, that the medicalization of prenatal care and birthing and delivery might shift some of the outcomes. Abby Ashola for Urban U. According to the American Pet Products Association, there are about 89.7 million dogs living in the U.S. That means there are more dogs in the U.S. than there are people in Germany or the U.K. And we know a lot of interesting things about dogs. For example, did you know that like human fingerprints, dogs have a unique nose print? Or that the shape of a dog's face reflects its lifespan? Longer face equals longer life and the blood pressure of a human and a dog both go down when a person pets a pup. And for those who are on a never-ending quest to learn more about their canine companions, CUNY has just the place, the Thinking Dog Center at Hunter College. Thinking Dog Center is a dog behavior and cognition um, research group. We're essentially interested in learning all about how dogs navigate the world around them, how they see the world, how they interpret it, um, how they interact with their owners. Dr. Sarah Elizabeth Biozier is the director of the Thinking Dog Center and has spent most of her career focused on dog behavior. Some of her earliest research that's still ongoing today involves how dogs perceive visual illusions. It all started with postgrad research at La Trobe University in Bendigo, Australia. She was supposed to study service dogs, but that changed. And we just sat down at a holiday barbecue one day. We started wondering if dogs could see 
illusions. And what turned out to be sort of just this, this joke of a question that was asked at a barbecue ended up leading us to sort of start searching. We started off first by testing the Ebbinghaus Titchener illusion in dogs. Once we discovered that, yes, there is in fact this field of animal illusions out there and people are studying them. This is the Ebbinghaus Titchener illusion. Which of those orange circles looks bigger? To most humans, the orange circle surrounded by the smaller blue circles looks to be bigger. But when you compare the two orange circles directly, turns out they're the same size. Turns out it's all a matter of our brains and perception. It's actually very difficult to map perception. So if I ask you, for example, is a strawberry red, you will say yes. But the question is, is the red that I see the exact same color red that you see? It could be a different shade. It could be a little bit varied. It, it may be that they look identical, but how do we really know? By studying how dogs perceive illusions like the Ebbinghaus Titchener, it helps us understand how and why we perceive it the way we do. And so one of the best ways to actually evaluate perception is to look at misperception, to see whether or not other animals also fall susceptible to sort of these like quick hacks. So what were the results? And so when we first started, we, we didn't really know. We were like, what are dogs gonna do? Is it, we actually found that dogs were susceptible to the Ebbinghaus Titchener illusion, but they demonstrated reverse susceptibility. Reverse susceptibility means that dogs also fell for the illusion, but unlike humans who think this circle is bigger, dogs see this one as being bigger. They're not alone in this reverse susceptibility. There are in fact other animals that do demonstrate this. And a lot of the time it, it comes down to how you process uh, an entire figure. So do you process the whole or do you process the individual components as being sort of singular units? Compared to us, I guess our brains tend to group things together. We tend to group things together. We are what we call sort of global processors. You know, I'm looking at this cabinet in front of me and I see a whole cabinet. I don't necessarily see the door handles and the doors and the drawers as separate entities. I see them as a cabinet. Illusion perception is also being studied in other animals like reptiles and fish and there are other animal illusion studies ahead for the Thinking Dog Center, some of which may involve cats. I'm Andrew Falzone for Urban U. Still up on Urban U? From Lehman to Hollywood. Stay tuned for more CUNY stories. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lehman Stages. We miss having you in our seats and on our stage, and we certainly miss coming to work every day. But throughout this pandemic, we remain resolute. Theater is full of traditions, like you don't say good luck to an actor before they go out on stage, you say break the leg. There's a certain Shakespearean play that we don't want you to mention by name inside a theater. And throughout this pandemic, our ghost light continues to burn bright. You see, another theater tradition is that every theater has a ghost and the ghost light is here to keep it company. It's the stage manager's job to, when the day is about to begin, turn off the ghost light, roll it away, get to work. And to signify that the workday has ended, roll out the ghost light to center stage and turn it on for safety purposes. That's why the ghost light is here. We don't want you walking into a dark theater and tripping over a piece of scenery, breaking something, breaking your leg. We don't want that. So the Lovinger Theater ghost is Reagan. Legend goes that he's a set designer that worked here in the 90s and passed away before he was able to finish a job. So he's a friendly ghost by all accounts, but we might see some lights flickering every now and then or a buzz in our sound system that no matter how many cables we switch out, we can't seem to make go away. We do hope to be able to roll out this ghost light soon and be able to share our work with you again. Until then, take care. My name is Richard Gladstein, and I'm the executive director of the Fearstein School, the Fearstein Graduate School of Cinema, which is part of Brooklyn College and part of CUNY. Um, we're located um, not on the main campus of Brooklyn College, but we're located at the Steiner Studios, which is in the Old Navy Yard. Steiner Studios is one of the busiest um, and most wonderfully outfitted um, sound stages in the country, and certainly in New York. 
and uh, many, many major films shoot here and have production offices in our building. Um, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel has their offices and City on a Hill. And so we're really part of a film making community here. Um, and we really value being part of that community. We have a fantastic environment here, which I'm now gonna show you. This is the entrance way and shows um, some of our donors. And when you come into the school, um, this is what you will see. So as we go down this hallway, the first thing that we're gonna encounter are one of our editing rooms. Um, they're all equipped with Avid. Our students work in here, learn in here, cut their films. And this is your standard editing room um, where you're gonna be cutting the films that you've made. We're gonna veer into here and this is where our music recording um, takes place. A wonderful board where our students can learn how to record and mix. First rate, top notch equipment. A wonderful studio, a Steinway grand piano. And then down the hall to the left is the Foley room. This is where you put in footsteps and the sounds of doors knocking and things like that. So this is how you add sound effects to your movie by going in that room right there and that wood floor opens up and there's sand and rocks and various textures that you can add to your movie. Then we have like Da Vinci Resolve rooms, which is how you color correct your movie. We have four sound stages. The largest one is 4,000 square feet. We have a construction shop to our right where people can build sets. This is the biggest stage that we have. Productions are made here. There are cinematography classes in here. There's directing classes in here. There's a grid up in the ceiling to hang lights. All of this is first rate, top notch, completely pro. This is an area for students to gather and collaborate. The school is all about collaboration. Writers working with directors, working with producers, working with cinematographers, working with editors, working with sound, working with music. The collaboration it is only possible by bringing people together in an environment like this. So that's basically um, our school. What's your name, honey? Uh, I'm Joe. I teach middle school band. Got it, go for it. How does one become a consultant for a Pixar movie? How did that come about? Well, actually, certainly not by my initiating anything, not my doing. <laughs> the filmmakers, Pete Doctor, through his research, he found me. He wanted the authentic perspective of a middle school classroom and uh, in my case also, just the fact that I'm a, a professional musician and a, uh, and a middle school band teacher. One, two, three, four, stay on the It was a fantastic educational, enlightening experience to work with Pete and the rest of the team. The consultants as well, Herbie Hancock, Terry Lynn Carrington, and all the others. They came and took pictures of, of my classroom drawings and so forth. I was able to offer advice. Like the movie's lead character, when starting out as a young musician, Peter never saw teaching as a career path. My goal uh, was just to perform <laughs> and finding my spark through music education, through teaching children, came by accident. Peter majored in trumpet performance at Queens College and then reluctantly accepted an internship to teach music. I already had this notion that the kids would be flying off the deep ends, climbing the walls and things like that. But once I began to see that the children were responding and they were listening and I saw the motivation that my thinking started to change. Instead of the three days, I started coming there every day and I stayed there for 34 years. It taught me a lot about life, about myself, and about what's important. There's more to life than just thinking about me, than just focusing on my goals. I mean, there's nothing wrong with practicing four or five hours a day, but when it's an obsession, as we have with Joe, <laughs> and when you're blinded by not realizing the simple things of life, it's a problem. I did it, I got the gig! While teaching music, 
Peter realized he can not only be a professional musician, but also have a deep impact on his students. There were so many stories I could share with um, kids who were struggling with different things, and through the music, through my mentoring, they succeeded. Hang on, hang on. What are y'all laughing at? So Connie got a little lost in it. That's a good thing. The film's positive message, Peter says, could not be timed better after all we've gone through with the pandemic. It gave people a sense of breath, a sense of uh, looking back at looking to themselves, actually, you know, asking the question, wow, what makes me me? You know, what's, what's important in life? For Urban U, I'm Mari Evami. But then I see this guy, and he's playing his chords with force on it. And then with a minor, I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. We leave you with Lehman Stages, featuring singer Cynthia Jimenez biding her time. And thanks for biding your time with us as we shared our stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. Next year, next year, something's bound to happen. Oh, this year, this year, I'll just keep on now. time.